Hey, how's it going everybody and welcome back to the channel. And in today's video we are going to take an in-depth look at the Supermarine Mark 9 Spitfire. Sit back, grab a pint or maybe even a rum ration, and in case you're wondering, those are indeed barrels of beer underneath my wings. So kick back, relax, and uh, let's look at the Spitfire today. Now, before we dive too deep into this, I need to cover one thing. Uh, when you buy the Spitfire, or if you're on the standalone version of DCS and do the, th the free two-week trial, uh, not only do you get a Spitfire, you actually get a second variant that comes along with it, and that is the clipped wing version of the Spitfire Mark IX. So the clipped wing variant gains uh, two advantages. It has a slightly faster top speed and a better roll rate compared to the normal wing Spitfire. Now, as with everything aviation, there are trade-offs with that. So while the while the clip wing flies a little faster and rolls a, li a little bit better, its rate of climb suffers. Its service ceiling is lower than the normal wing Spitfire. Its turn radius is larger than the normal wing Spitfire. And the stall speed while in a turn is different too. You'll, you'll stall the wing on a clip wing Spitfire sooner than you would on a normal wing Spitfire. So that's just something to be mindful of, but you do have both versions of this whenever you buy the Spitfire. Now, regardless of if you fly with the clip wing version or the normal wing version, they both operate the exact same way, so I'm only going to cover the normal wing Spitfire, but I did want to highlight the differences between the two before we get into this. All right, here we are in the cockpit of the Spitfire. Now, compared to the North American airplanes, uh, the Spitfire is a lot more simplistic. And at the same time, a lot of the controls are kind of scattered around the cockpit. Once you get familiar with the layout, it's it's pretty easy to find stuff once you know where to look. Starting with our cockpit controls, we're actually going to turn around and look all the way behind us because there's a pretty significant control here at the back. Uh, this black pull handle, that is the canopy control, and that's how you can open and close the canopy just by simply turning around and clicking on on that, your pilot will pull the canopy close, and it's the same thing to open it. Uh, that red ball there at the top, that is the emergency canopy release. So if you have to bail out, that is probably the control you want to pull first and get the canopy clear to the aircraft. Also, uh, right above it is we have a rear view mirror. Pretty important for checking six and if you're in a turn fight to see if anything else is coming up on your tail. Pretty useful. All right, moving on to the left-hand side of the aircraft, and we have a side door on the left-hand side of the Spitfire, and you can open it by clicking this particular handle right here, and now your door is open. Uh, nothing that you want to do in flight, and unfortunately, with the door down, now you can uh, click the handle, so you have to map the control in order to bring it back up. All right, just below the door, you got two wheels. Uh, for your your two trims uh, you only have a rudder trim and the elevator trim all right moving underneath the trim wheels we have this column of switches and this is an introduction to push buttons in the Spitfire so almost every push button inside the Spitfire has a protective guard on the top of it and even if you have that particular button or control mapped to a joystick button, uh, it will. you are still required to flip open the covers in order to access the button. It's one of the, it's one of the quirks of the Spitfire. And to an extent, the Mosquito as well, they kind of follow this same, same design. All right, so at the top, we have the oil dilution button. This button, uh, after the engine is running, and if it's really cold outside, you can push and hold that button for 10 to 30 seconds. And what that does is it actually squirts gasoline into the engine to help thin out the oil to, keep, to help reduce your oil pressures down to a manageable level. Below that, uh, the second button down is the supercharger test button. And I'll demonstrate that whenever we are, when the engine's running. But what that does is it tests that the supercharger will shift into high gear and then 
the bottom button is the radiator test button and not very useful for in flight however as you push and hold it it forces the radiator flaps open on each wing and i'm showing that here on screen right now so as you hold the button the radiator flaps will open and then once you let go of the button they'll come back closed again all right moving forward of that we have three toggle switches now for those of you familiarized with the north american way of switches like especially light switches uh, normally up is the on position and down is the off position in a general sense that is reversed over in great britain so up is the off position and down is an on position so all right first one is labeled radiator flap and what this does is right now it is set to auto so the radiator doors will open and close as needed based on the engine temperature uh, if you flip the switch to down what that does is forces the radiator doors to their full open position in case you got an overheat situation you're dealing with that will force the doors wide open uh, second switch here forward is the pedo heat it keeps the pedo probe underneath the left wing from icing over and causing an airspeed pro um, airspeed indication problem all right forward of the pedo heat switch you have the fuel pump switch which is only used when either the engine is running or you have the uh, the fuel cutoff pulled all the way back which it is right now and I'll detail uh, fuel pump uses when we get to the uh, to uh, running the engine all right next we have a black lever that's just on the side and this is for the carburetor air filter control uh, if you are on a grass or a dirt airfield you'll probably want to set this forward to filtered air for your engine for all ground operations once you're airborne you want to you want to put this handle in the aft position for your ram air and that allows ram air to come in through the the air scoop that's on the chin of the aircraft moving forward of that we have the throttle quadrant uh, this first lever all the way outboard is the fuel cutoff uh, with it in the aft position the fuel there is no fuel that is able to flow through the carburetor into the engine for run to get the engine running we'll have to flip this forward to the run position and this uh, and this one being cut off all right inboard of that we have the main throttle and then inboard of that we have the propeller lever that controls the rpm of the engine the throttle will control the manifold pressure uh, moving up the canopy wall on the left hand side we have the radio uh, it's a four channel radio you cannot change the frequencies the only place you can change the frequency of the radios channels is in the mission editor uh, once you are in the aircraft you cannot change the frequency you can only change the channel of the radios and it has your uh, top button is off that shuts the radio down entirely and then you have your four channels alpha bravo charlie and delta Moving on to the instrument panel. I'm starting at the bottom corner. We have two toggle switches and this kind of runs counter to the up is the off position on most switches. On the magnetos, the up is the on position. Uh, this controls both your number one and number two magneto that fires the spark plugs in the lovely Merlin engine that's uh, up forward. Just to the right of the magneto switches we have the a triple gauge that has three needles on it the upper needle which actually spans a full 180 degrees uh, left to right that is your main air pressure for your uh, for your pneumatic system uh, the pneumatic system runs your your wheel brakes your supercharger gear shift the gun firing mechanisms in both the machine guns and the cannons as well as your flaps so that's a pretty important system in the spitfire is your uh, pneumatic system uh, the two gauges on either side on this triple gauge that are labeled port and starboard that is the air pressure going down to your wheel brakes and the the wheel brakes in the spitfire are very unique and they are going to be their own little segment in this video a little uh, uh, just after i go through the cockpit tour 
All right, moving up above the air gauge, we have our clock. Uh, slightly inboard of that, we have a trim position indicator. This is uh, our elevator trim. As we move the trim wheel up and down, we can watch the needle move up and down with it. So there's our neutral position. Uh, right above that, we have the landing gear indicator uh, that will light up and tell you if the gear is in its up or down position. Uh, if you're flying a night mission with the Spitfire, you have a handy little night shade that you can pull down and cover up that so that it's not so bright. Alright, immediately above that we have the oxygen system for the pilot. Now, we have the demand gauge over on the left, and we have the bottle gauge on the right. That, tell, that tells us how much oxygen is left in our oxygen tank. Now we have this wingnut looking object in between the two gauges. Uh, this sets the mode of the oxygen system from normal, which is how the wingnut is positioned. If the wingnut is positioned horizontally, you are in the normal mode. If you want emergency oxygen, you give that a click, the wingnut goes vertical, and your demand gauge goes to full deflection. Uh, and you're breathing 100 per, your virtual pilot that is is breathing 100 percent pure oxygen at that point however that comes at a cost as your oxygen tank will pretty much be empty in about 15 to 20 minutes so like i said normal position leave this horizontal and the pilot will uh the oxygen system will regulate that accordingly all right right above it and kind of hidden so if you're looking through the gun sight it's hard to see this switch, but that's a, that's a good switch to know the location of. This switch turns on and off the navigation lights. So that is the red and green lights on your left and right wing, respectively, plus the white light on your tail. Next to it is the flap handle uh, that sets the position of the flaps. And the flaps in the Spitfire are either up or they're down. And that's something I can demonstrate on the ground because, like I said, uh, they are powered by the pneumatic system, which has pressure right now. So let's go ahead and send these down. So that's the control, and that tells you which way you commanded them to go. Now let's look out on the wings, and where's the flaps? Well, the flaps in the Spitfire are pretty unique in that they are a split flap design. And as you can see here, this is why you can see that they are split flaps. The upper surface of the wing does not move, but the lower surface of the wing does. Well, that's great and all. Well, how do we know that they're actually down or they're up? Well, if we look out on the wings, on both left and right wings, we see two little tabs that protrude up. And when they are up, that signifies that that flap is down. So if we go ahead and send the flaps back up, you notice that the little indicators went, uh, fell, they hinged back down and fell flush with the wing surface. That's normal. So that is your flaps. That is how you know that the flaps either went up or down. Don't rely on the, on the flap valve in order to determine that. Always look out at your wings to make sure that your flaps are in their correct position. All right, moving on to the center of the instrument panel. We have our primary flight instruments, and that's the six pack of gauges right here in front of us. Uh, top left, we have the airspeed indicator. Now, the needle on this airspeed indicator will actually do more than 360 degrees of sweep. So the way this is read is initially, you follow the needle and follow the outer scale, and this is in multiples of 10, so 60 knots, 80 knots, 100 knots, etc. So you would follow the needle through its arc of travel on the outer scale at first. Once you hit 280 miles per hour, that's when you shift to the inside scale because the needle will continue to wind around. All right, top center, that's our artificial horizon. 
Uh, top right, we have our climb and descent indicator. This will tell you how what your rate of climb is in thousands of feet. Down on the bottom left, we have the altimeter. Uh, the only nuance with this is your altimeter is set by millibars. It is not in inches of mercury. It is in millibars. All right. In the center, uh, bottom center, we have our directional gyro. And then finally, on the bottom right, we have our turn and bank coordinator. Now this looks different if you're used to something like in the P-51 or any other aircraft that has the that has the little ball in the curved tube of glass. The same rule applies as if it were the ball in the curved tube of glass. If the needle is deflected to the right, you need to apply right rudder to center the arrow. If it's deflected off to the left, you need to apply left rudder to center the arrow for a coordinated turn. It also is handy when you're trying to do straight and level flight and how to apply the correct amount of rudder trim. All right, underneath your primary instruments, and I'll just move the stick out of the way, we have our, our backup wet compass. Uh, just above that at the bottom of the panel, we have two knobs here for our floodlights. I'll just set those on. Now, the instruments are not backlit like uh, a lot of instruments tend to be. You have two lights on either side of the cockpit. There's one right here, and the one on the right is right there. And these knobs control those, so if you're doing night flights, there is your cockpit lighting. Now, to the immediate right of those two knobs, we have two push-button covers guarding the starter button and the boost recoil button. Those are very important for starting the engine. All right, and speaking of engine, the remaining instruments on the instrument panel all deal with the engine. So this gauge at the very top of the instrument panel that is measuring our battery voltage. This is a 12 volt system, so that needle should be above 12 at almost all times. And that will read higher once the engine is running and the generator is spinning. It'll charge your battery. All right, moving below that, we have the tachometer, uh, engine RPM. Uh, below that, we have a switch with a, uh, with a indicator light next to it. This is your supercharger control. And with the switch in the down position, the supercharger is automatic. And once you climb past the supercharger changeover altitude, which is roughly oh, between 14 and 16,000 feet, depending on environmental conditions, but somewhere in that altitude range, the supercharger will shift from its low speed to its high speed gear. So it'll provide more boost pressure for your engine so you could uh, climb to higher altitudes. This indicator light next to it will indicate whether or not that the supercharger is in high gear. If it's lit, it is in its full speed uh, or high speed gear. Uh, this red colored gauge to the right of the supercharger controls, that is your manifold pressure. It's measured in pounds per square inch. Uh, these three gauges, we have this one oriented vertically. That is your oil pressure gauge marked off in pounds per square inch. Uh, oil temperature is this yellow, this round yellow gauge, and that's marked off in degrees Celsius. And then that green colored gauge is your coolant temperature for your uh, your engine coolant. And finally, that brings us to the fuel uh, fuel gauge, which is the final stop on the instrument panel. Uh, to the far right, we have a fuel pressure warning light that will light whenever the fuel pressure uh, in the system that feeds up to the carburetor is running is 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 low. That that will light up, letting you know that you have low fuel pressure. Uh, now we have a fuel tank gauge, and right now it is reading zero, and there is a reason for that. The fuel gauge in the Spitfire does not read continuously; it is electrically powered. And in order to get a read on your fuel tank, you have to push this button next to it. And then you have two sets of numbers. Uh, the upper span of numbers is when your tail is on the ground, like it is right now. 
the bottom gate uh, the bottom arc is used for whenever you're in normal level flight now this is indicating that I have a full tank of gas which seems awfully low that it's only marked off to 37 gallons well here on screen I have the diagram of the Spitfire's fuel system and this is out of the Spitfire manual that comes with the Spitfire uh, ignore the two fuel tanks that are behind the canopy those came on later variants of the Spitfire and are not equipped on the DCS Spitfire but I do want to draw your attention to the two tanks that are forward of the cockpit. You have two fuel tanks, and these this is your main tanks. You have an upper tank and a lower tank. The upper tank contains 48 gallons of gas. The lower tank is 37. Combined, they give you 95 gallons of internal fuel. Now, whenever you push that button on the dashboard that to have the fuel gauge read, if it goes to full deflection at 37 gallons, that is telling you two things. First, that your lower tank is full of fuel and that your upper tank has an unknown quantity of fuel in it. And you can kind of guesstimate that based on how long you've been flying. So the upper tank drains to the lower tank. So as fuel is burned, the upper tank is what empties first than the lower tank. The only time you'll get a read on the lower tank is whenever the upper tank is empty and you've drawn down a little bit of fuel out of the lower tank. All right, moving on with our cockpit tour. Uh, move the stick out of the way again. Just to the right of the wet compass, we have this main fuel valve. Uh, right now it's set to off, but in order to turn on the gas tanks or to open a valve to feed the engine, you have to set this to on. Uh, off to the right is the fuel primer, which you have to use your mouse wheel to unlock and prime the engine for starting. Uh, and off to its right, you have this one valve that's marked fuel tank pressure off on. All right, so a quick talk on fuel tank pressurizing. Gasoline readily evaporates, and it does so a lot easier up at higher altitudes. Now, to prevent the fuel from vapor locking the engine at high altitudes, uh, some compressed air could be used to pressurize the fuel tanks. And that's what this valve controls. So once you make it above 16,000 feet, you wanna open the fuel tank pressure in order to keep your engine running properly at high altitudes. A word of caution is this tank pressurization does interfere with the self-sealing capability of your gas tanks. So if you get a hole in your gas tank, it's very good idea to turn this off if you have it set to on. Uh, normally at low altitude flights, takeoff, landings, this is set to off. Uh, moving up above that, we have a few things here. Uh, we have this little black electrical switch gear here. And these control some marker lights that are on the top and bottom of the aircraft. And they are white colored lights. And you also have a telegraph key. So the forward switch controls the, the belly light. The upper uh, the, the switch towards the back controls the upper light. And you can set them to that they're continuously burning off or controlled by this telegraph key. And with them set to the uh, Morse position, you can you can send Morse code to your buddies. Moving further aft of this, we have this fuel pump here. This is a mechanical fuel pump that is only used to pressurize the fuel system. Now, what is the name of this thing? Wobble, 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 wobble pump. Oh, yes, the wobble pump. Thanks, Bonk. All right, so that is used to pressurize the fuel system, and I will demonstrate this thing's use uh, when we get to the engine starts. Uh, this is a leftover from the earlier versions of the Spitfire that was then taken the place of by the electric fuel pump. The Mark 9 has both systems, and either one will work for you. So if you use one, uh, pick one over the other. Don't use both. All right, underneath that, we have the landing gear lever, which is right here. We have a couple more switches. Uh, this black uh, valve handle here, this is 
controlling the fuel from an external tank. You can only hang one tank on the Spitfire and that's on the belly. Uh, this red handle immediately behind that will will drop the, whatever drop tank that you're carrying. Uh, we have a pair of toggle switches for the IFF destruction that I don't believe is modeled within DCS, but you can still click on them. Uh, we have a windshield de-ice valve, which I don't think has any function within DCS, but you can toggle it. Alright, and the last stop on our cockpit tour is this carbon dioxide bottle that's bolted to the cockpit wall with a red valve handle. What is this for? Well, this is for deploying the landing gear if the hydraulic system fails. So if you put the gear handle in the down position and the gear either doesn't come down or fails to lock, mostly because you've sustained some level of combat damage, well, in order to emergency drop the gear, you need to make sure this handle is set down and then open this valve. And that will blow down the gear so, and hopefully affect a good landing for you. All right. Well, there is the cockpit tour. Let's move on to brakes. All right. So let's talk about the brakes. The brakes in the Spitfire are very unique. Uh, you do not have toe brakes as is found on almost every other aircraft. Uh, the brakes are powered from the pneumatic system and are controlled by this handle that's on the back of or the forward side of the control column, which is moving right now. Looks like a uh, what you would find on a motorcycle. I want to call your attention to the brake gauge that I highlighted earlier. I'm going to keep the brake handle in view as and then i'm also going to pull up my control overlay right there on the bottom left of the screen so in dcs i don't have a hand control on my joystick for the brakes so i have assigned my toe brake axis on my rudder pedals that sit underneath my desk so i have a map to both the left and right toe so as i push on the brakes and you can see that on the controls overlay and the further I push down, the more the handle pulls. Now, if I call your attention to the pneumatic gauge, and you can notice now that there is air pressure showing on the brakes, both left and right. So, that has activated both brakes equally. And if you let, and if you ease off that handle, the brakes release, and the air pressure is released as well. Now, if you notice that the air pressure in the system has steadily dropped as I've used the brakes, that is normal uh, for the tank to bleed down if you use the pneumatic objects. The engine is not running, and the engine has a compressor on it that recharges that air cylinder. All right, so how do we get differential brakes? Well, this is where you really got to pay attention and learn how to taxi a Spitfire, because this is a interesting system like I mentioned before. In order to get differential brakes, you have to input some rudder first and then activate the brake handle. And you notice I fed in right rudder or I'm sorry, I fed in left rudder and activated the brakes and now only my left brake is active. My right brake is not doing anything. So that is how you get differential brakes in the Spitfire. And the same thing if you want right brake. Feed in some right rudder, activate the brake handle, and and so on. And with with a neutral rudder input, you get both brakes. Taxiing this can be a challenge, especially if you've never done this before. But understanding that how that brake system works is half the battle of taxiing the Spitfire. All right. Let's move on to cold starts. All right, let's move on to cold starts. Now, the Spitfire does not feature a parking brake, but there is something we can do in order to have the same effect as a parking brake. And that is to use our mouse and mouse wheel the brake handle on the back side of the control column. And what that'll accomplish is that will 
that will put air pressure down the bolt brakes holding the airplane in place and until you use whatever control that you have assigned to the brakes uh, the brakes will stay like this acting as a parking brake of sorts a useful feature especially since none of the warbirds in dcs uh, have the capability of using wheel chocks all right for cockpit setup we want to go as follows we want to push the propeller lever full forward uh, in order to activate the instruments and indicator lights we need to throttle up about halfway so that the switch uh, gets caught by the throttle handle and then we bring the throttle back and then open it at about half inch to an inch all right and we can see our landing gear indicator has activated and our fuel pressure warning light is lit. Uh, so next step to take care of the fuel system is we need to open the main fuel valve. And here's where you can take two different paths as far as pressurizing the fuel system. You can either turn on the electric fuel pump for a few seconds until the light goes out and then turn the electric pump back off. As you can't leave it running during startup. The other thing you can do is use the wobble pump here on the right hand side of the cockpit and pressurize the fuel system too. Both methods work. I've used both successfully and it really doesn't matter which method you choose. Just pick one and stick with it. Now to pressurize the fuel system, now that we have the main tank on, we pump this handle about 10 times. and the light went out meaning our fuel system has been properly pressurized all right next we need to prime the engine and it's a nice warm summer day out so you will need uh, normally you would need between four and ten shots of primer uh, you use less primer whenever it's warm you use more when it's cold out so we put the mouse wheel over the primer and unlock the handle and then we give this about four pumps All right, four pumps, and here's the important step. Put your mouse wheel back over it and lock the handle. If you forget to lock the handle, it's very similar to what happens in the P-47. The engine will run funny afterwards. All right. Next, this is, this is easily overlooked, but you want to turn on both magnetos. One and two. All right, so prop lever, throttle, fuel system, check. Make sure we have gas in the tank. We do. All right, we are ready to start. So next we want to open the covers on the starter and the booster coil. Uh, now this technique that I'm about to show you will require both hands. Uh, the default key bindings to the starter button and the booster coil button are the home and the delete key on your keyboard. and what I will tend to do is operate those two buttons with my left hand. Uh, so I'll get the engine cranking, I'll hit the booster coil, and as soon as the engine sputters to life, I have my right hand uh, ready to go over the fuel cutoff handle and move that forward to enable the carburetor to start getting fuel from the fuel system and run the engine. All right, so let's see how this looks. So I'm gonna start cranking the engine holding the home button and booster coil sputters to life put the fuel lever forward and be ready on the throttle and throttle it back down to 1200 rpm for warm-up there's 1200 we notice a drop in pressure on our manifold gauge that's normal we have a rise in oil pressure on our oil pressure gauge indicating about 90 about 100 psi right now uh, Oil temperature is about 20 degrees, that should start rising, and the water temperature is just below 40. Alright. Items to do after startup. Now we uh, cover the starter and booster coil caps. Uh, we can set our compass. Like so. And just take a quick gander around the cockpit, make sure everything else is looking normal. Everything's looking good. All right. 
now we just wait until our engine warms up. We're looking for at least 40 degrees C on the oil before we start taxiing. All right, so we'll see you guys after the warm up. Alrighty, there's 40 degrees C on our oil temperature and we are ready to taxi. All right, now for taxi, like I mentioned during the brakes segment, uh, this is an acquired skill in the Spitfire. Uh, as you have to feed in rudder and manipulate the brakes in order to affect a turn, uh, I'm going to pull up my controls overlay so you guys get to see exactly what I am doing. You guys can see my brakes are currently active, as you can see on the slider bars there. Alright, it's just a short taxi off to the runway off to my left there, but you guys get at least get to see the process. Now, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the rudder... The rudder on the Spitfire is pretty large, and it's in the slipstream of the propeller. So, given that, you can make minor corrections when you're traveling in a straight line. You can actually swing the nose left and right use, using the rudder alone. If you have to make a major correction to your direction though, you have to use the brakes. Alright, let's come off the brakes. After you start rolling, you can probably throttle down. If you stay at 1200 RPM, you're gonna get, you're gonna start going a little fast. Alright, left rudder. Let's start swinging the nose over. And then to come back in a straight line, feed in opposite rudder and use its brake. There's my runway. Look through my turn. Straighten up and gently ease on the brakes and come to a full stop. Alright, let's move on to the run up uh, and make sure that all of our systems are in proper working order. Uh, check our fuel tank. We have a full, uh, the lower tank is completely full, meaning that it's full and we have some gas in the upper tank. Alright, what I want to do now is throttle up to 2000 RPM. And hold the stick back so we don't, uh, so the tail doesn't start to fly off of the pavement for us. All right, check our oil pressure. It's just below 90 PSI, that's good. Oil temperature is above 50, also good. Boost pressure rose slightly. Uh, we wanna test the supercharger uh, drive system, so we open the second switch and push its button. Oh. We have a light indicating that our supercharger shifted into its high-speed gear or full speed gear as indicated by the FS that stands for full speed. All right, we can let go of that and close the cap and it shifted back to low speed. All right, now we want to test our magnetos. So 2000 RPM, we should see a small drop in RPM when we shut off half the plugs and we did. Turn that back on, turn off the other side, another drop. You can quickly uh, turn them both off Make sure that it does cut out. That's good. And turn them both back on. Should see a slight rise in RPM with them both on. Excellent. Check the air pressure system. The engine's running, so that should maintain good pressure. The uh, tank pressure should be pretty much straight up and down. And lastly, we want to cycle the prop and to make sure that the RPM changes accordingly. Bring it back up. All right, looking good, and bring her back down to a th 1200. All right, and there's a the run up. Let, let's move on to takeoff. All right, so for takeoff, we want to set our takeoff trim to neutral. Uh, so our elevator trim, I'm sorry. Just hold that forward or spin in that wheel and we want it to be forward uh, rudder trim you want to set uh, at least half of your rudder trim so you want a fair amount of rudder trim to the right to help counteract the uh, the pull 
Alright, so another thing you want to do on takeoff is to hold in some right aileron. And there's a reason for that. Let me throttle up the engine. Just watch the wingtip of the right wing here. You notice that the wingtip rises whenever I throttle up. That's in response to the torque of the engine. So, to counteract that on our takeoff roll, we want to put in a little bit of right aileron. Just a little bit. You don't need a whole lot. Because as you do your takeoff roll, once you lift off into the air, if, you, if you're not already holding in a little bit of right aileron, you're going to start a bank to the left. So this is one thing to do to counteract that and during your takeoff roll as well so you don't veer off to the left either. All right, everything's looking good. One last check around the cockpit. All right, we generally do not use flaps on the takeoff. That's, a, that's more for landing because of the amount of drag that they give to the aircraft. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm normally shooting for about 3,000 RPM on the gauge, and I usually take off at 7 PSI manifold. Uh, if you're carrying bombs or the drop tank and are really heavy or you're doing a short field takeoff, you can increase that to 12 PSI. Alright, one last note on the takeoff, there is no lock, there is no locking mechanism on the tailwheel whatsoever. So you are very reliant on your rudder to keep you straight and uh, to keep you going straight down the runway. And like I said a minute ago, it, the rudder is pretty large, it's in the slipstream, it's very effective, and, and you guys will get to see that here. Alright, so we throttle up to 2000. Last check of the gauges. My generator is producing 15 volts. That's good for the electrical system. All right. So, all right. Let's commit to takeoff. Brakes off. Right rudder and throttle up gently to 7 psi. Airspeed's alive, and we nose forward to start picking up some airspeed. take some practice at 120 and gently lift off all right airborne positive rate gear up gear handle comes up now the down light extinguished meaning the gear is in transition now our up light is lit meaning the gear is up and locked so at this point I have a good amount of altitude, I've got a good amount of airspeed, I want to bring the RPM back and now I can do a to 2650 on the RPM. I'm already at 7 PSI on the boost gauge and we are at max continuous in order to affect the climb. Alright, and that's the takeoff. So after takeoff, now that we can center up our trims got a noticeable amount of side slip to the left so let's apply some left rudder trim there we go and get some positive rate of climb with the up elevator trim all right at this point we also want to look over our instruments we have 80 degrees Celsius on the oil temperature About 100 degrees Celsius on the coolant temperature, that's perfectly fine. Good oil pressure. Everything's looking good. And we still got a full tank of gas. Alright, that is the takeoff, everybody. So, like I mentioned before, you got 48 gallons in the upper tank, 37 in the lower, that's 95 gallons total. Not a lot of flight time. and. That's not necessarily a huge problem because the Spitfire is, uh, with this V12, it's pretty efficient. You can, you can move quite a long ways with just uh, 95 gallons of gas. Alright, well what if you want to go farther? Well, they have drop tanks. So the Spitfire can be fitted one with one of two drop tanks. You have the slipper tank shown here on screen. 
you also have the torpedo tank. Now, both tanks each hold 45 gallons, so you don't gain any extra fuel by using one over the other. Uh, the slipper tank may be slightly more aerodynamic than the torpedo tank. I personally haven't noticed a huge difference between the two. Take your pick on that if you're taking a drop tank. All right, so how do we use the drop tanks? Well, we look down next to our seat, we locate the drop tank fuel valve, which is this black handled uh, lever right here. We have to first turn on the drop tank and then we turn off our main tank. And as long as your engine stays running, you have fuel in the drop tank. There is no way of knowing how much gas is left in the drop tank until your engine starts to run rough and quit like it just ran out of gas. And that is literally because your drop tank is out of gas. All right, that's what it sounds like whenever your engine is running out of gas because your drop tank just went dry. All right, so in order to switch back, we need to turn the main fuel tank back on, turn off the gas tank, engine recovered on its own, and then, then we can pull the handle and drop, get rid of the drop tank. Now, if you need to, sometimes you may have you may have a low pressure light, you hit the wobble cup wobble pump a few times and that'll bring your fuel pressure back up even more so if you're running the electric pump all right let's talk about power settings for this engine and that's uh that's a key piece of running the spitfire all right so it's always a combination of your engine rpm settings and your boost pressure now currently i am at maximum continuous on the engine that's the power setting i can run all day long as long as i have fuel and that's 2650 rpm on the tachometer and 7 psi on the boost pressure gauge right about there all right so what about combat power well like i mentioned earlier we first want to increase rpm so combat power we increased to 2850 right about there and then our boost pressure can go up to 12 psi we can sustain this power setting for about an hour before suffering any uh, engine damage now if we needed more power than this like if you're in the thick of combat being chased by a bf-109 if you need more power you can go to war emergency power so that is full forward on the RPM, so 3,000 RPM, and up to 18, so I'm up at altitude, I can't get 18 pounds of boost out, but I'm at 16. Uh, 18 is this little tiny arrow at the bottom of the gauge. You can sustain this for about three minutes before you have to back out of it and come down to a lower, lower setting. All right, now maximum continuous is not the most fuel efficient of modes. So we can reduce our power to a lower level and really cruise a lot farther. So uh, one of the easiest ones to remember is, I call it the rule of twos. Set two PSI on the boost pressure gauge and then 2200 RPM. So again, that's 2 PSI and 2200 RPM on the boost pressure. You can fly for a little over two hours using uh, the internal gas and the drop tank. So this is, this is a pretty good power setting. It's a good compromise between fuel efficiency and speed. All right, here we are up at altitude. I'm about 14,750 feet, and I'm about to demonstrate what it looks like when the supercharger kicks into its high speed or its second gear. All right, so I will come off of active pause, and let's do this. Come on, baby. Oh, there's that side slip. Let me trim that out. Now, as we climb up higher and higher, pay attention to both my boost pressure gauge, which is at about 7, and the supercharger light.
Oh, there's the supercharger right there. You gotta be ready for it and pull back on your power once it goes into its high speed as you continue climbing up at altitude. Now, now that we're up at altitude, the supercharger's at its high speed, this is a great time to turn on the tank pressurizing to keep our, uh, to keep their engine from getting paper locked at the higher we go. At whatever altitude it shifted to high speed, it will shift back to low speed at a lower altitude than where it shifted to high speed. So let's look at that. Let's dive down. Always keep an eye on that boost pressure. Keep it. You do have a pressure regulator, but you do got to keep an eye on it and reset it from time to time. And that's by using the throttle. Up oh, there it went. Back to low speed. And back to max continuous. Alright, and away we go. Nice. Alright, that's supercharger operation. And now that we are back below 16,000, we can turn off the tank pressurizing. Alright, let's talk about combat employment. Now, we have the gun sight glass just in front of us, and to turn on the projector sight, we look around the gun sight on the instrument panel and locate the switch and turn it on. Uh, the brightness control is just off to the right. So now we have our crosshairs. Uh, the gun convergence in the Spitfire is about 350 yards, or about 900 feet, somewhere in between 300 and 350 yards. So we notice that our range is currently set to 350, good, and then this bottom ring here is set according to the wingspan of the target you're trying to attack. Most uh, German fighters right there are around 35 feet, so that's about where you want to set. And that setting will change the gap here in the middle of the crosshairs. So you notice if I bring it up, increase the wingspan setting, the gap does increase. Put it back down to 35 feet for a fighter. There we go. All right. So that's the gun sight. It is not gyroscopic based. It's fixed in position. So uh, if you're doing air to air, you have to f you have to figure out how best to lead your target in order to affect hits. All right. In order to turn on the guns, which you have four. 303 caliber machine guns out on the edges of the wings. And two 20 millimeter cannons located more, uh, more middle of the wing. Now, in order to turn this on, you have to, you have to uh, disengage the gun safety. And you can tell that you did that by looking at the top of the control column. You got this little pin that pokes out of the top. If it's poking out, your guns are ready to fire. And you can set them up to various triggers in the uh, controls menu. I have them set so that one trigger is my machine guns, another trigger is my cannons. Now, the 303s aren't very large rounds. They're, they're a lot smaller than the uh, 50 calibers so they don't hit as hard. And even though that they are smaller, you don't carry a lot of them. You only get 350 rounds per gun. Uh, you get about 120 rounds, if I have that correctly, for the cannons, for each cannon. So not a lot of 303s, but those cannons can definitely hit hard whenever they, whenever they do hit. But... And you can definitely see that convergence if I uh, go for a little bit more of a top view. With those, with those guns out farther out on the wing, their convergence is a lot shorter than what the P-51 is. That's just the machine guns. You don't get tracers in the uh, cannons, so you don't get to see those. And that is the machine guns. 
Now, that same safety mechanism that you have to disengage will also activate your bomb release mechanism. So if you are carrying bombs and you can carry up to three bombs, one center line and one on each wing, uh, there's nothing you have to do in cockpit in order to arm the bombs. You just make sure your weapon safety is uh, disengaged and you hit the, uh, the weapon drop and the bombs will come off your wings armed and ready to go. Now, turn performance for dogfighting, this is an excellent aircraft for that. You're, like I said, you have very large control surfaces out on your wings. They are very responsive on the controls. Even if you're going fast, they are very responsive. Uh, and like I mentioned before, if you have a shorter joystick, you will find this aircraft incredibly responsive to other stuff. So, let me show you, like on my controls overlay, I'm not moving the stick very far to do good rolls. So if I go full deflection, which I almost never do, that's pretty impressive. And very same if, if I get into a turn and pull hard. She has a very, very tight turn. But like I mentioned, your gun sight does not move. It's not a gyroscopic gun sight like the American uh, uh, gun sight. And you can definitely tell you need to lead your targets. You can't even see the bullets dropping very much anymore. They're down there. Alright. So that is definitely something to practice with if you're doing air-to-air uh, -air gunnery with the uh, Spitfire. The maneuverability of the Spitfire is fantastic. You can outturn almost anything except an I-16. Now, keep in mind that even though you can outturn anything, a lot of other aircraft will outrun you. The BF-109 is a great example of that. So. Turn fights are great. I would avoid getting into... I would not follow a BF-109, especially if he appears to be going a lot faster than you. Wait for him to come back and attack you. And then use your uh, superior maneuverability to, uh, to get on him and take him out. Alright, so that's just a brief look into combat. I'll probably come cover air-to-air -air combat in a, in, a, in a more specific video. This is more of a general get familiar with the Spitfire video. Alright, let's move on to landing and this is the thing that held up this video for a lot longer than I wanted it to. Landing the Spitfire is a challenge. Uh, you do not have a lockable tail wheel. It is very easy to ground loop this aircraft. And with how narrowly spaced the landing gears are, it is very easy to tip this thing over on a wing. Landing this thing is difficult. It will take a lot of practice. And a very light touch on the stick, which uh, I'll bring up my controls overlay again. And let's look at this. So what our goal here is to slow down and get down to about 160 miles an hour minimum in order to drop down the landing gear or the flaps and if you forget that there's a little note on the instrument panel that says not to drop your flaps below or above 160. All right so I'm going to come off active pause and what I want to do now is I want to throttle back and get my boost low and bring my engine rpm up and this is going to have the effect of slowing me down. There we go, about 2850. And I'm going to bank off to the right a little bit. Give me some separation from the runway. Which is right there. Drop down some altitude. Alright, my airspeed is below 160, so I'm going to drop down the gear. Gear handles down gears in transit because the up light went out and now my down light is locked. Bring back in some throttle, keep my airspeed. Yeah. 
There's a shot of how narrowly spaced the landing gears are. Alright. Go ahead and drop the flaps. And I want to maintain about between 100 and 120 in the pattern. It's slower than the uh, than the American uh, aircraft like the P-51 or the P-47. Keep my airfield in sight. Nice gentle turn. You notice I'm not moving my stick very much. This takes a very light touch. And I just want to call out the side slip indicator. You want to make sure that that arrow is pointed straight up. If you have any side slip on touchdown, your tires are going to get traction and you are going to go for a ground loop and you better hang on for a very wild ride. That landing speed is pretty slow. Uh, almost down to 60 miles an hour depending on your weight. You want the landing to come as a surprise. Don't force the landing. It's very easy to bounce and crash this airplane. See, I'm already slipping just a little bit. A little bit of throttle. A slight bounce. Cover. And down. And then throttle the engine down gently. And get up on the brakes. You can see my rudder. My rudder is losing effectiveness, so I need to use the brakes to keep directional control. My goal when I land the Spitfire is just to stay on the runway. Now, as I'm pretty competent in the P-47 and P-51, uh, landing this thing was a significant challenge for me personally. I it took a good week of practice just to get to that point where I could have a good landing for the video. Is uh, like I said, it is very easy to have too much side slip on the landing, and you end up in a ground loop, or you tip a wing over and scrape the ground with it, or even worse, uh, jam up on the brakes too hard and tip the nose over and wreck the engine. And let's just taxi over to parking. Uh, another thing, do not be afraid of the grass. Uh, all the warbirds can taxi across grass without getting stuck, unlike some of the jets. So if you've ever run into that with the jets, it is not a problem with the warbirds. Alright, here's an example of how my earlier landings went in the Spitfire. I'm coming in a little fast. Touching down a little too fast. Bounce. And overcorrecting leads to your wings getting dragged, a uh, nose over, and stuff like this happens. So just because you touch down in this aircraft does not mean that your job is over as a pilot. It, you pretty much have to fly this thing the entire way to a stop. So, it this is probably one of the more difficult warbirds to land. But once you get the hang of having a light touch on the controls, letting her land when she wants to, and just maintaining directional control down the runway, uh, you guys will... It, it's very rewarding once you hit that point, because... This is what held up this video for the longest time, is just getting that landing down. Alright, now in order to shut down the Spitfire, what we want to do is throttle up to 1500 RPM. And then hit the fuel cutoff lever. Increase the th full throttle as the engine winds down. That clears all the fuel out of the intake and the cylinders, makes it safer for the ground crew. And engine comes to a stop. Now we can throttle all the way back. 
come off the brakes. And we can shut off this little switch. It turns off all our cockpit instruments. And we can turn off our main fuel supply, turn off the magnetos. And we are done. Alright everybody, that is an in-depth look at how to operate and fly the Spitfire. Uh, I will be featuring this more in future videos. I'll probably do a combat employment video as well. With that, thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed this, and we'll see you in the next one.